Hello ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you to a new episode of the Organized Crime Banking at its Finest show and for this purpose I am now connected with the financial analyst Rob Kirby in Toronto, Canada. Howdy Rob. Uh, nice to hear your dulcet tones from Germany today, Mr. Lars. I'm very pleased to have you with me today. Um, Rob, uh, the reason why I wanted to talk with you is something that the U.S. Commodity Futures Trading Commission, CFTC, announced this week. Tell us, what kind of announcement did the CFTC made? Uh, the CFTC's announcement was regarding a roughly six-year investigation they had been making into allegations that the silver market was, was rigged. And uh, so after six years of investigating this, or almost six years, they, they announced this week that allegations that the silver market was rigged uh, are, are without merit and, uh, and are baseless. Yeah. That's the essence of what they said, uh, Lars. Yes. Uh, however, um, our friend Chris Powell had a different kind of approach to this announcement. Can you tell us about this? Yeah, well, Chris Powell... Chris Powell's uh, uh, analysis of the CFTC announcement mirrors the position that I've held for uh, many years now. Um, and, and, and Chris bases his uh, assessment off of the uh, uh, pronouncements of Blythe Masters, who is the uh, 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 head of the commodities trading division at J.P. Morgan & Company, and uh, the essence of Blythe Master's assertions earlier this year were that uh, J.P. Morgan does not manipulate uh, uh, the commodities markets and specifically the silver market, um, uh, that J.P. Morgan only acts for clients. And uh, uh, basically, I mean, J.P. Morgan has been, the, has been connected to the uh, allegations of, of silver market manipulation for many years now, and uh, uh, Blythe Master's assertion that J.P. Morgan doesn't trade in the commodities for their own account per se, uh, but they trade for clients. And when you when when one considers the scope and the size of J.P. Morgan's derivatives book, and then when one connects the dots with what Blythe Masters has stated that J.P. Morgan trades these derivatives positions on behalf of clients so when you so when you factor in that statement along with the size of their book and the and the nature of the positions as in uh, for, for me anyway my bent is is really interest rates and when you consider the size the multi-trillion the tens of trillions that JP Morgan has for instance in interest rate swaps on their book and when you consider how relatively few players there are in that market and then when one also considers that banks don't do anything for for free and don't take risk for free and 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 uh, you know this 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 ultimately when one connects the the mosaic of of data points in front of you you can only come to one conclusion that jp morgan's derivatives book the primary counterparty in their in their derivatives book is the U.S. government itself, and so Chris Powell's assertion is that uh, uh, Blythe Masters, when she stated that J.P. Morgan trades uh, commodities uh, uh, with with clients, uh, she's telling really a half truth in that. Uh, because most people would assume when she says that they trade with clients that the clients are the free market. But J.P. Morgan, and, and then this isn't strictly just to J.P. Morgan because it also applies to the likes of Goldman Sachs and Bank of America and Morgan Stanley. When they trade these derivatives, uh, derivatives in strategic commodities in key markets, the primary counterparty, uh, the other side of this trade, is almost exclusively the U.S. Treasury itself, and specifically within the U.S. Treasury, an arcane and, and, and little understood entity called the Exchange Stabilization Fund, or the ESF. 
And what these banks do when they trade uh, uh, with the Exchange Stabilization Fund, the, the, the act of trading, for instance, the act of trading an interest rate swap with the Exchange Stabilization Fund, when banks trade interest rate swaps, they are hedgers. They, they have to execute a trade in the securities market to hedge their interest rate swap position when they trade it. And in a vanilla interest rate swap or an interbank interest rate swap transaction, what typically happens is the receiver of fixed sells to the payer of fixed uh, a duration weighted amount of bonds in the term that the trade's being done for. So in, in layman's terms, what that means, Lars, if a uh, if in, in an interbank 10-year interest rate swap transaction, the receiver of fixed sells to the payer of fixed, which would be one of these commercial banks like J.P. Morgan, would sell them the amount of bonds. So if they do a hundred million 10-year swap, the the receiver of fixed will sell to Morgan roughly a hundred million dollars worth of 10-year bonds, which Morgan uses to hedge the trade. That physical bond transaction happens in an interest rate swap. And, and, and a lot of people don't understand that. Uh, but what happens when, when, the, when the ESF is involved is they don't provide the bonds to the payer of fixed. And that means the payer of fixed has to go into the bond market to buy those bonds. And that creates settlement demand for bonds. And that's how and why we see instances of fails to deliver bonds and we see tightness or scarcity in, in the bond market, settlement demand scarcity, regardless of how many bonds the U.S. government is uh, issuing or printing. And it's, it's an artificial scarcity that is brought on by trading of derivatives. Now, what I've just cited is interest rate related, but the, the, the nature of paper uh, creating, you see, Futures markets and 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 in settlement, uh, people who are settling these trades don't distinguish between physical and and the and the paper uh, and, and the paper instrument. You see, the COMEX when COMEX or when the LBMA trades a gold contract. They don't distinguish in, 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 their, in their trade the difference between physical and paper ounces. And so by creating this massive torrent of paper trade, uh, the, the market pricing mechanism uh, can't distinguish between physical ounces and paper ounces. And thus, uh, you know, uh, unfortunately, uh, our our settlement process in 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 gold in physical gold is dictated by what the paper price uh, is trading at, as delineated on LBMA in the London market or COMEX, uh, for the most part. So what Chris Powell was saying is that the uh, J.P. Morgan is. Is uh, uh, or the CFTC is saying that there, there, there's no nothing untoward going on in the uh, in the metals markets in terms of price rigging of metals, and the reason why they they've come to this conclusion one can logically assume, and what Chris is stating is that the CFTC is a part of the government. They're they're given uh, the, the 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 job of regulatory oversight of the commodities trading markets, and the uh, the, the the likes of J.P. Morgan, uh, they're trading. Their client is the U.S. government, and and basically what they're saying is that when the U.S. government decides or or makes it legal for themselves to manipulate a market, it's not considered. Uh, illegal. So basically, what we're saying, or basically what, what's inherent in, in in that in that judgment by the CFTC, is that the U.S. government is itself above the law. Yeah. And and actually, if you look at the Exchange Act as it's written, when the Exchange Stabilization Fund was created back in the 1930s, they were given 
uh, by an act of, or you know an order of Congress. They were given uh, 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 they were given like this this mandate that basically put them above the law and uh, like a, like a, a nor the, these people the, the exchange stabilization fund does not does not provide uh, a financial uh, you know a financial statement every year they they are above the uh, they're above the oversight of Congress and they report to nobody except the treasurer of the United States uh, and, and, and ostensibly the, the, the president of the United States. But what they do is in secret. It, it's, it is in theory or it is, it is written that it's legal for the Exchange Stabilization Fund to act in any market. Uh, they're involved in it. And, 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 a, and a person who's actually documented the, the nefarious nature of the Exchange Stabilization Fund is a chap by the name of Eric de Carbonell. And he has a website uh, called marketskeptics.com. And Eric de Carbonell is a very interesting fellow because his great grandfather was none other than Frank Vanderlip, who was one of the original framers of the uh, Federal Reserve Act back in 1913. And uh, Eric, Eric, was a, was a person who blogged about the uh, rigging of markets and the uh, and and the shenanigans that the U.S. financial system uh, uh, had been up to for a number of years, and he produced uh, he produced a video series, a five part video series back in June of 2011. Uh, giving a, a, a very good breakdown of what goes on and, and how the Exchange Stabilization Fund operates. And shortly after producing that series, um, Eric de Carbonell basically disappeared off the face of the earth and uh, a few short months after that. And uh, Eric de Carbonell is somebody who I used to have some contact with and he's just disappeared in, into the into the ether. And uh, somebody who, uh, uh, who who claims to know of him and what's become of him told me that he had uh, very suddenly uh, moved away and bought a farm in Russia and is now a farmer. Mm -hmm. uh, he doesn't answer emails. He doesn't return. Uh, you know, he doesn't respond to anything. My my guess wonder is whether he was threatened uh all i can tell you is the the series the video series he produced on the exchange stabilization fund and how it operates and, and, and what they do uh in my view is basically kryptonite to these to these vampires that that behave in untoward ways in our financial markets yeah. so i guess so i guess in summary the the exchange stabilization fund is the is the counterparty uh which is a part of the government is the counterparty of this metals manipulation and uh the cftc is never going to basically the government's never going to rat itself out and uh because in 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 their twisted minds it's all it's all legal it's uh, when, when the government commits crime it's not crime because the government's above the law or these people, these these rogue elements within the government, think that they act, uh, you know, with impunity. Well, they do act with impunity, but let's just see how long the rest of the world uh, tolerates tolerates this nonsense. Because the the dots have been connected in terms of what is going on and what is being done and the fraud that's being perpetrated on the world and you know this this is this this is something which has earned uh which has earned america uh, a very 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 dark shadows under their eyes and this is this is uh this has led to already uh america becoming isolated in, in the world community and America is behaving more and more as we move along here, more and more like a rogue state. And uh, it's hard for me to say that, uh, to be honest with you, Lars. I, I, find I have a great deal of difficulty uh, identifying America as a rogue state, but the, the way they're behaving 
on the world stage is uh, is quite a disgrace to their to their uh, to their to their history and to their founders and to the framers of their great constitution and and uh, the, the people that are running America now. America is a captured country, and uh, America's got big problems, yeah. huge problems. Yeah. And with that, I throw it back to you, Lars. I mean, I don't know if I've described this in a way that makes sense to you. And if there's any points that I should be clearer on, please let me know. Well, uh, I understood it. Um, my next question would be, is the Exchange Stabilization Fund the biggest player in international finance there is? In my view, Lars, without a doubt, the Exchange Stabilization Fund is the most powerful financial entity on the planet. Mm -hmm. And how does it come that we never hear about it? Because what the Exchange Stabilization Fund does is all done in private. And, and this is where I reference back to Eric de Carbonell's uh, video series. If you go to marketskeptics.com, you can see the links in the, uh, uh, in the right hand column. You can see the links to the video series. And I would recommend anybody who hasn't seen it already to take the time to watch it. And what you what what you'll what you'll glean from watching that series is that these people act in the shadows. These people do not admit anything that they do, and they have the latitude to do whatever they wish. Yeah. From from literally from uh, 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 murder for hire to running drugs to. Uh, illicit arms transactions, uh, uh, they have the latitude to do all that and then some. These people are more secretive than the CIA, they are more secretive than the NSA. Yeah, um, Catherine Austin Fitz likes to, uh, to call this uh, exchange stabilization fund um, the mother of all slush funds. Can you explain what a slush fund is? Well, uh, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the case of the Exchange Stabilization Fund, I would, I would personally think that their, the financial resources at their disposal would, would, would number in the trillions, and it's all basically unaccounted for money. And it's all very likely it's, it's, it's money that's been pilfered. It's money that's either been pilfered or, or earned through illicit means which has accrued in a, in a blind fund which gives the operators of the ESF uh, the resources to do everything from nation building to uh, hiring uh, private mercs to, to intervene militarily, covertly in countries, to building underground bases, to, to having a, a, a private secretive uh, a space program that runs parallel to uh, what NASA would do. Like, we're talking unimaginable amounts of wealth, which is in a blind uh, fund which nobody can track. Yeah. And, but, 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 but do understand this. When the ESF shifts monies around, they do so through the Federal Reserve System, through the Fed wires. So you see, it's people in the central banking community uh, can't can't claim ignorance to, to, to what's going on because because they see the footprint of this entity in the marketplace at all times. So Ben Bernanke's aware that this goes on. It, it, I mean, it's a little club. It's a little club of secret squirrels who who are who are sworn to uh, say nothing. Everything that the ESF does is done under the auspices of national security, and that's how these criminals. And that's how these criminals justify uh, their their criminal acts because they they uh, they wrap themselves in the flag, committing crimes, and say that it's all being done in the interest of national security. I mean, it's a perversion of reality. It's a perversion. It's a perversion of the truth. It's a perversion of reality. And it and it, it, it again, it just speaks to how captured the system really is. Okay, one last question. 
what are your thoughts on the fact that Commission member Bart Chilton stated that he's disappointed about the outcome of the investigation of the CFTC? My view of Bart, my view of Bart Chilton is not something very favorable, and and Bart Bart Chilton is a Bart Chilton might as well be the the uh, might as well be the monkey carrying the cup uh, for the organ grinder, uh, you know, in in a in a in a cheap street. Uh, you know, performance. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, Rob, for this conversation. Uh, glad to have done it, Lars. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Cheers.